The nations, you are listening to the world's number one Christian station, Worship Center Radio, the platform of champions. Coming up next is the Marketplace Connection. Linda Hunt. Welcome to the Marketplace Connection. Well, good morning. Good morning to the world. Good morning to Detroit. This is the Marketplace Connection and I am your host connector, Linda Hunt. I am so happy for those of you that are joining us today, wherever you are in whatever part of the world that you are in. I thank God for your life and thank you for getting up this morning and joining us this morning. We have an absolute great topic that we are going to be talking about this morning. It's a serious topic, but it is a great talk topic. We have somebody here that is an expert in her field, and we are going to be discussing some things that I believe that will be an absolute blessing to your life. Now, I want you to go get your iPads, your iPhones, and wherever you are, and whatever instrument that you would use to pick up this broadcast and tell a neighbor, tell a friend that the Marketplace Connection is on the air. The Marketplace Connection is that kind of broadcast that would empower, uplift, and encourage, and most of all, inform. It is our desire that those of you that are in the four walls of the community of the church would empower yourself with the word and with information that will change your life. You have gifts, you have talents, you have a call that God has destined you to do something. And so you must do it for a greater cause other than for yourself. I was reading this morning, uh, 1 Samuel 17 and 29, and the Bible talked about David and how when uh, they were out fighting in the uh, valley, the, the Bible says, and they were out fighting for uh, against Goliath and against all of the enemies. And the Bible says that when the other uh, Saul, King Saul, and the other Israelites were just standing around afraid because they were facing a giant, what kind of giant are you facing today? What kind of valley are you in today? Well, we are here to empower you and uplift you. But David said a very important, he asked a very important question. He said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause to do what we are doing today? We are here to be a blessing to your life. Just like David, David was there because there was a cause that he needed to kill the giant that everybody else was fearful of. So if you have fear, If you have worry, if you have doubt, we are here because there is a cause. And the person that I am going to introduce to you, she has dedicated her life to this cause, to domestic violence, a very important topic for women. And there are some men that actually deal with domestic violence. But today we are going to deal with that. And we want you, as I said before, tell a neighbor, tell a friend, the Marketplace Connection is on the air. And that's why we are here today to help you face your giant. And before I introduce her to you, I'm just going to read a little bit about my my friend uh, that I just recently met. And I am so happy to know Kaylin Risker Foy. And she just recently got married, so I got to get used to that name. And she is a survivor of domestic violence and human resource professional. Ms. Risker has earned her Bachelor's of Business Administration in Human Resources Management from the Davenport University. She has many, many organizations and leadership positions that she is a part of. But she, uh, because of her own situation, her own personal situation, she is a domestic violence survivor, and she started an organization called SAFE. And SAFE is Sisters Acquiring Financial Empowerment. She started this organization, SAFE, in 2006. And the focal point of this organization is to provide survivors of domestic violence appropriate financial tools and resources needed to leave or recover from the economic portion of domestic violence. 
So you are going to get information that is going to empower you today that you might be able to leave that situation. If you are in that situation today, I want you to call in. We have her here. I want you to take advantage of being able to speak with her today. And that number is 248-796-8241. 248-796-8241. And I want you to call in today if you have any questions for uh, Kaylin while we have her here with us today. We want you to take advantage of that. Kaylin is also a member of several, as I said, leadership and advisory committees, uh, including the Avon uh, Cosmetic Company, a national di uh, domestic violence advisory board. She is on that board and as well in Wayne County. Uh, uh, account, uh, the Wayne County, excuse me, Council Against Family Violence and Transformation Detroit, which is a project of the Institute of Domestic Violence in the African American community. So I want you, she's got all of the, all of the accolades, she has all the experience, she's got everything that you need today to set you free from your giants in your valley today. So I want to introduce to you my guest today, I am so proud of you, Kayla, Thank and you. what God is doing in your life. Kaylin Risker. So say hello to my, uh, my viewers hello. and listening audience. Hello, hello, and thank you so much for inviting me on today. I'm honored. Thank you. Amen. Well, you have an extensive uh, bio. We we're going to be talking about some of those things. I didn't read it all because it's too much for me to read, but we want to be able to inform you. That's our purpose here today. And so we thank God for you and what he is doing and what he is going to do in your life for your organization, SAFE. And it is an organization that is an absolute blessing to women. Uh, that are dealing with a domestic violence situation, which is a very serious situation. And yes. it's happening every day. Mm -hmm. Women are being abused. Women are being, uh, you know, beat on. Women are being, you know, molested. Women, you know, every day we are dealing with this situation. We turn on the news so we know it's a real situation. Right. Definitely. So, amen. So, uh, uh, Kaylin, uh, you are a human resources. We're just going to get right into the interview. Okay. You are a human resources professional with a company. Tell us a little bit about, you know, that and how you got started before you got into this. Well, actually, how I got started in, in the human resource field was um, it actually starts with my survivor story and my um, story of domestic violence. I... Um, in 1998, I was in an abusive, a seven and a half year abusive relationship with my oldest daughter's father. And um, it was abusive on every level, um, particularly economic mm. abuse. So at that time, I only worked a part time job. And Labor Day weekend of 1998, he assaulted me and shattered my left eye socket. I have a titanium implant that replaces the bone under my eye. Mm -hmm. And I'm very fortunate and very blessed to be here today that I can see out of both my eyes with context. But I can still mm -hmm. see out of both my eyes right. and that I don't look like I sustained that level of injury. But at that time, I couldn't see. I had double vision. I couldn't uh, figure out how I was going to live and sustain ourselves because I didn't get like any type of short-term disability or any benefits. So I, we didn't have any money. And he was in jail waiting his trial and his legal proceedings. And we're at home, and I, I just didn't know what to do. I go to the domestic violence program where I was getting counseling for me and my daughter. And I say, you know, um, I'm really having some financial problems. My gas is about to get cut off. They're going to repossess my car. And I said, um, I don't know what to do. My doctor won't give me a return to work note because of my physical injuries. They don't feel like I'm fit to return to work, but I need to do something. I think I just need to go to work and just work it out. Mm -hmm. And the woman said, she said, well, um, did you try it? Maybe you should try working for McDonald's. And I felt twice victimized because Why? she didn't even, not that, not that there's any, anything wrong with working for McDonald's, but it was you didn't even take a chance right. or a moment to see what was my skills, knowledge, my background, what my work history. It was just like, this is the type of job that's good enough for you. Right. I mean, even though there's various levels of jobs at McDonald's, but that I should just take any, just go get a quick entry level position. And that was hurtful. So I, the job market was different in 98 than it is today. Yes. So I was actually able to get a job in doing payroll processing. And while I was there, I messed up a lot of people's paychecks because of my double vision. So this is why I really shouldn't have swung <laughs> back to work, but I was trying to work it out. And so... They called me on the carpet and they said, okay, perhaps we start you off too aggressively. 
we're going to retrain you and demote you, but we're going to keep you at the same pay. And I was just grateful that they weren't going to mess with my money. I just knew that was just God. And so I stayed there and they retrained me and I got stronger physically, but I never told them what was going on with me. And in retrospect, they should have known. I should have felt comfortable to say that this domestic violence situation was going on, but I didn't want them to judge me or treat me some kind of way, so I didn't say anything. But what if he wasn't locked up? He could have been stalking me. It could have been a situation where it could have brought right. problems to the workplace. Right. So I got stronger, and I started to actually love the work. So I eventually went back to school, got my undergrad and my master's. I moved from payroll to other areas of human resources, worked my way up. And um, I eventually started working for this HMO that's now closed in the city of Detroit. And as their human resource administrator, I was over their benefits and their payroll and all the other aspects of human resources. And while I worked there, I saw how domestic violence affected women on various levels of the workplace at that hospital HMO, in that hospital HMO setting. But I saw not only how it affected the victims themselves, but how it affected their coworkers. Because coworkers would be concerned about their right, colleague, right. you know, or put themselves in harm's way. Like I'll take you home to make sure you're safe, or or talk about the other colleague. Like now mm -hmm. I have to do more work because this person is missing more days of work, or they're not as productive as they used to be. And then I how I saw how all of that affected the company's bottom line as right. a whole. So. From my own personal experience, but mostly my professional experience. And honestly, the catalyst for starting SAFE was from a divine inspiration from the Lord. And that's when SAFE started in 2006. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, I know that that, uh, you know, I know that situation very well. And, um, you know, in my own life, you know, so I can attest to, you know, those kind of things. And you feel so, you know, like you're so by yourself, so alone. Yes. And I know, and, and a lot of those victims, and, and that's part of the problem that a lot of times people don't feel like there's help out there for Correct. them. Correct. But there's organizations like you, and out of your own experience, you weren't selfish. And that's a good thing, you know, because a lot of times women don't want to deal with, you know, their own circumstances. Right. These alone help somebody else. And I felt that way. And I don't think there's anything wrong with taking care of yourself first, because there's also people out there who are hurting mm -hmm. and aren't in a good place themselves. Right. And then they go and try to help other people and hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about my story, I really emphasize that what happened to me happened in 1998. I went, got help from counseling. I started to my walk with the Lord, started to get closer with that. Okay. And then I didn't, the, then he didn't actually, God didn't actually tell me to start the organization until 2005, late 2005. And okay. I didn't actually walk into it until early 2006, April okay. 2006. So it was a period of time that I needed to, to heal. heal. I needed to yes. get some stuff together myself before I went out and trying to help somebody right. else. Right. I needed Absolutely. to be in a good space. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a good thing, and and that's very important, like you said. You do need to heal. You yes. have to be whole, mm -hmm. and a lot of times, you know, people shun away from the healing process. Yes. But that is a very real process yes, that it you is. have to go through, and you and you got to go through it. Give yourself the time. Give yes. yourself the space yes. to go through that yes. healing process. Yes. So you were a member of many leadership and advisory uh, committees. Tell us a little about a little bit about some of the leadership and advisory committees that you were part of. Well, a lot of those situations came from me volunteering and um, and and wanting to know more about domestic violence from my own experience okay. and and seeing how nonprofits work and connecting with other domestic violence organizations and other domestic violence leaders. And so by me. You know, sometimes when you're starting an organization or starting a business, you don't have the financial resources for your own business. Uh -huh. And so you definitely aren't thinking about volunteering for anyone else. Okay. But I know, <coughs> I know through my HR background that volunteering is the best way to get hands-on, practical experience, make connections, network, et cetera, and do the work. So it started with me volunteering for people who are my mentor and then me working my way up and getting opportunities that I would not have normally gotten by doing that. Okay. And so that's how starting as a volunteer and then eventually leading the organizations like becoming one of the, the lead people for Transformation Detroit. And now I'm on um, Chief Craig's, the chief of police um, 
his community advisory board. I'm one of those, one of the members of that board. But that came from putting in the groundwork first and really putting in work and supporting other people and their missions and their things while I was building my own. Right. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Right, so, um, excuse me. <clears throat> so these active roles are just membership roles. Are they active? Or yeah, membership? very, very active, hands on, you know, really talking <coughs> about um, how to help in the community, but in different ways. So, for example, the um, the committee that I work on with Avon, with Avon Cosmetics, uh -huh. that's actually approving and reviewing grants that they give to domestic violence organizations. Where, when working with the chief of police committee, is what can we do, you know, as leaders in the community mm -hmm. together to reduce mm -hmm. violence as a whole. Right. And so my role at the table, I feel that my role at the table is to always bring up domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, right. and bring, you know, where other people might talk about whatever organization, you know, elder abuse or child abuse, which are all important, but I'm bringing that particular voice okay. to the table. And Transformation Detroit, we do a lot of advocacy and awareness and provide training to other advocates okay. in Detroit in regards to violence against women issues. So each of these different organizations help me to connect, work with other people and work with to bring this work forward in different ways and strengthen the community and the people that are doing the work as well as bring awareness to community members in regards to ending violence against women. Okay. So elder vi um, domestic violence, that is a, an issue as well, uh, dealing with elderly people being uh, under a caregiver? So, a yes, there's an elder abuse committee which deals with, with elderly being abused by caregivers and families and things of that okay. nature. But within domestic violence, or I, I try to use the word intimate partner violence so people okay. can dif differentiate between domestic violence, just violence at home, versus violence between intimate partners. Intimate partner violence, which is what we focus on specifically, Effects from teenagers to senior citizens. There are so many senior citizen women who have been, are currently, and have been in abusive relationships for decades. And family members, because it's so normalized how grandpa treats grandma, right. they don't even realize that this isn't right. And unfortunately, there aren't very many resources for an elder woman to start on her own when grandpa is the one with the health insurance for her high blood pressure and diabetes right, medicine. Right. You know, and so she has a doctor's appointment every month that she has to go to and get transportation for. She's not going to leave him. And what if she does leave him, then what she's going to do, what recourse does she have? And it's very, very, very challenging, but it's very real. It's very heartbreaking to see our mm. senior women going through this. You know, mm. when you get to your golden years of your life, right. you're supposed to have a good life, not live in fear. Right. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my last guest, um, that's what we dealt with. She has a adult uh, foster home. And, okay. you know, we dealt with the fact that you know, having the right place where people can be safe. Right. So, you know, that, that goes hand in hand. And we definitely, you know, we want our seniors to live and live long. And live yes. A, you know, and to live a life where they don't have to they live They paid fear. their dues. Absolutely. It's the time to be, they're supposed to be happy. Yes. You know? Absolutely. Yes. So you were featured in an article written by uh, Valerie Jarrett, the yes. senior advisor to President Obama. Uh, call, it's called Putting an End to Abuse in the October issue of the Essence magazine. So tell us a little bit about how that came about and how did you, um, you know, get in, uh, well, Valerie Garrett to make a comment on that. So I got a call from the White House from uh, Vice President Joe Biden's office okay. as asking me if I wanted to be, if I was interested in being a part of this. And when I got the call, I was actually in the grocery store parking lot and I <laughs> said, yes, of course, <laughs> you know, whatever you need for me. Of course, I was so happy. And so I asked the question, well, how did you hear about me? And it was so awesome because the lady who I was talking to, the representatives from his office, it mentioned three names. Like, this person mentioned you, and then this person mentioned you, and this person mentioned you. And so all I can say is just be encouraged. You never know who is watching you and who Absolutely. knows your name. That was so encouraging to yes. me. And so from this article, I was actually invited to Vice President Joe Biden's home for a special reception honoring wow. the Violence Against Women Act. And then they invited me back the next year, which was 
for the 20th anniversary of the Violence Against Women Act, and it was a, another reception at his home as well as a presentation. Okay. So, I mean, it was just, you just, you just never know. Wow, okay. Well, that's very prestigious, and Thank congratulations. You. Thank you so much. And what year was that? That was in 2013, and then I went back again in 2014. And um, so it was like September or 2013. October, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So okay. it was in that time range. And um, I was just happy because my mom was still around. And she was so proud of me that yeah. I was able to go. And and how they heard of my name is just from the work that I do. I do a lot of speaking. People um, outside of Michigan uh -huh. are really curious about the work that we're doing with SAFE here in Detroit. Okay. Because we started doing this work in 2006, mm -hmm. and we've actually helped women to become financially self-sufficient from abuse. Okay. If you're able to do this in Detroit, then yes, we want you to come to Texas. We want right. you to come to Illinois. We want you to come to right. Florida and tell us how we can help other survivors in our community. We don't even have it as bad in our community as we perceive that you have it in Detroit. So if you're able to help people in Detroit, then we want to learn more about it. I recently... Um, a, a group in um, Barbados uh -huh. heard, looked online, found out about our work, and invited me there to speak at a conference that de that was for human resource professionals and tr tips and strategies for them to help victims of domestic violence in the workplace. So I just did that a couple of months ago. So okay. just by doing this work and really, you know, speaking and helping people and other organizations in other states and now countries um, um, is how people hear about me and the work that we're right, doing. So. Right. Well, that's good. Thank you. You represented Detroit. And, and that's a good thing because, you know, most big inner city, um, you know, places like Detroit, uh, people look to us a lot of times for mm -hmm. answers because of the fact that they, they know we deal with it on a larger scale. Right. So they figure if you can do that in Detroit, you can come and do this and or help us and teach us right. what you know. And so we can get a program like this. And is this a national program? Is this, you know, or is this? SAFE is a Detroit-based or Detroit -based okay. organization. We try some expansion outside of Detroit, just in the southeast Michigan area. But then three programs closed in the last five years. So the overwhelming need for support for survivors of domestic violence, specifically in Detroit, is quite frankly overwhelming. So we just had to narrow our focus to just Detroit and just help okay. our community. But um, beyond that is where we'll go out and speak and do some other stuff. And we're looking at doing some other internet and interactive things that other places can then tap into and help survivors beyond our area. Okay. All right. So um, you are director and founder of the executive and the executive director of Safe Sisters Acquiring Financial Empowerment. And so, you know, just tell us a little more about, you know, SAFE and just some of mm -hmm. the actual things that, you know, SAFE does, some of the roles of SAFE. And, you know, just tell us a little bit about, you know. So that. SAFE focus specific, focuses specifically on economic empowerment. Okay. So when people think about domestic violence, they typically only think about the physical, verbal, emotional abuse. Right, absolutely. Though the domestic violence work, uh, what people don't realize, the domestic violence... Domestic violence has only been against the law on a national level since 1994. That's the same year my oldest daughter was born. Okay. So it's not that long that it's been against the law on a national level okay. that you cannot abuse your intimate partner. This movement itself is less than 50 years old. So the first thing they started with the communication and bringing community awareness around was the physical, then the mental and emotional. But those are actually only three components of a whole cycle of power and control, which is domestic violence. Domestic violence isn't about I hate you or somebody snapped. It's not an anger management issue. It's about one person, the abuser, wishing to have complete power and control over the victim, who they also say that they love. Right. So one of the tactics that are used is economic abuse. So that's keeping your partner from working. If they are working, having access to their own finances, their name isn't on the house, the car, the credit card, the checking account. You probably isolated them from friends, family. Absolutely. You know, you threatened your children. You threatened their life. So now I'm trying to go. I want to go. But how do I 
move when I don't have the financial resources or a place to go. Currently, in the city of Detroit, there's only one domestic violence shelter with 68 beds. Hmm. That's for women and children, so that's not even 68 survivors. The statistics are one in four women have experienced domestic violence in their lifetime. You look at how many women live in the city of Detroit, you take a fourth of them that might need services at any time from this shelter, and it's only 68 beds. So it's easy to say, well, why don't they go to a shelter? And then people will say, well, I heard of another shelter, but it's not a domestic violence shelter, so it's not offering that same level of confidentiality, safety, counseling services, there has been incidents where a woman has presented herself to a traditional co-ed shelter and the abuser has then followed right behind or present her, herself as a, oh, a homeless yes. person, come into the shelter and then abuse this woman. Wow. This has happened. So the need for specific domestic violence, 24-hour shelters is important. There are also um, places called transitional housing for survivors of domestic violence. But these are not emergency. These are places where you have to actually register for, sign up for, application process. Perhaps some money is required. This, again, is not that 2 o'clock in the morning I'm standing on the corner with my phone, my cell phone, and my baby on my hip trying to figure out where do we go next. Because of that need is where we come in and we help specifically with, okay, how do I get money? How do I save money? How do I hide my money? How do I look for work if I'm being stalked? How do I go back to school? I want to start my own business, but I live in a shelter. You can't do that. And so we help walk survivors through all of that with one-on-one -on -one training. We also offer um, co many conferences and workshops. We have a, work a conference coming up in April called mm -hmm. our Open for Business Conference. We normally have it in October for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but this, this year we're going to have it in conjunction with Money Smart Month. And so really looking, it's going to be a dress for success event. We're going to give away suits, talking about returning to work, starting your own micro enterprise. How do you start a work with little, uh, your own business with little or no resources? Okay. So these are the things that we're talking about for 100 survivors of domestic violence. Um, we do a lot of community and training, specifically around safety planning, budgeting, starting your own business, looking for work. And just being aware of what laws and resources are available to you as a, as a survivor. Okay. Now, where is that, um, you know, where is that going to take place, this, um, you know, workshop that you're having? Well, people will call to register. We don't usually um, promote the location, okay. especially of our larger events. Okay. Um, but they can call us, 800-757-4919, to get more information about our okay. Open for Business Give that one conference. more time. 800-757-4919. And then they can also, you know, check back on our website, newsafestart.org. It's N-E-W-S-A-F-E-S-T-A-R-T. And, you know, look up Sisters Acquiring Financial Empowerment, like our Facebook page, because we always update that as well. Okay. All right. Well, again, if you have any questions for Kaylin, you can call in this morning and our lines are open and the number is 248-796-8241. We would love to have you call in with any kind of question. You don't have to give your name or anything if you don't uh, desire to. And we'd be more than happy to have her answer all of your questions. OK. All right. So is uh, insane financial. That, does that mean financial assistance or sponsorship or, you know, what, what exactly do you mean by that financial empowerment? So really self-sufficiency. So okay. becoming self-sufficient of abuse financially so that someone else isn't controlling your financial moves and, and, and what does that mean? And so that's like a huge level of freedom to be responsible for your own financial choices from leaving a financial a financially oppressive situation. So we don't actually give money because we don't. So is this why they're still there in the. Oft sometimes. Okay. Sometimes that's a big, um, a big component of when the question is, why does she stay? Okay. So you don't have the financial. It, it's, it's often not that simple. It's a multi-layered thing. So why don't you, why do you stay? You don't have the money. You don't have the resources. Um, perhaps not only do you not have money, but this person might have, you know, used your identity and got credit cards. So now your credit and your bank accounts, you can't open up an account in your name, is in a worse state than it was just you not having it. It's bad. 
so you can't even access or open up your own stuff now. You have to go through like a lot of things to clear your record up, and that takes time. You've also been isolated from your friends and your family, so you can't reach out to other people to help you. Mm. You've um, been economically, physically abused, threatened that he's going to kill you. See reports every week about a woman being killed by their partner. That's real. Yes, it is. That's real. You know, that's not an unfounded threat. So you have all of these things together makes it really challenging for a person to move. But with our organization, what we do is we work with the one component, the economic piece, mm-hmm. and safety planning around that. And while we're working on that, we're working on other pieces as well. Sometimes it's slower moves to move. Because mm-hmm. the, with domestic violence being about power and control, what happens is this person wants complete power and control over you. At the point that they feel that they're losing this power and control is where things escalate. So they cannot be aware that you're making moves to leave them. So making, getting upset and saying, this is why I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I'm tired of you is the worst thing to say ever. Because okay. at that point, the person <clears throat> is like, oh, I'm, you're slipping away. And now I'm going to exert more physical force. I'm going to exert more things to keep you and entrap you. So you don't want to let them aware of that. So those right. are the conversations that we have. Yeah, I, I know. I was reading uh, an article, <clears throat> and I think you had, um, you know, just kind of uh, put a like on my Facebook page. And the article was talking about, you know, he uh, beat me, and then he sent me flowers mm-hmm. the next day. Now, this this particular woman, whether it was a real, you know, incident or not, but she had a black eye. Mm-hmm. And um, she was, I guess at that point now, she feels like, oh, he still loves me. He sent me flowers today, but yet... You know, I have this black eye, and now he's sorry, and I feel like maybe it was my fault. So now I'm second-guessing myself as to whether uh, I really want to leave. Uh, does he really love me? Maybe maybe I shouldn't have said what I said. And, that, and that's a real situation. I it think. does happen, but that's part of the whole cycle of power and control and domestic violence is that sometimes it's these honeymoon periods okay. where they remind you why you fell in love with them in the first place. It, it's very... Um, Sometimes with abuse, it's not every single day, you know, and then right. there's a thing, there's a lot of, of work and study being done around, you know, once a person's um, been mentally and emotionally abused, you know, they're very vulnerable and you would do a lot of second guessing and a lot of self blaming and a lot of self doubting mm-hmm. in addition to the fear. So it's all of these levels. I say, okay, well, maybe we can work it out. Maybe I can just stay for the kids. Maybe I can stay for the kids because I don't want the kids just living right. out in the street because there's no shelter. I'm going to just um, basically sacrifice myself to make sure that my kids are eating and have a place to sleep every night. These yeah. are all things that really happen. Absolutely. And when you have children involved, I guess it's even more complicated because, like you said, you know, you don't, a, a lot of women don't want to be in a shelter. They're afraid of. You know, being in an environment right. that's unfamiliar to them, uh, being around other right. people that they don't really know, and you have children. How will my children get to school? Right. You know, how will I be able to provide for them? You know, and so all of those questions. It does. But conversely, you know, children who are in abusive homes are a higher risk to become in abusive relationships themselves or to become okay. abusers. Yes. So... A lot of women who come to our program is because, not because of themselves, but because I'm worried about my children. Yes. You know, and I know my oldest daughter, we had some issues that we had to work through, you know, as a result of her, when she found out th- the story as she got older, that her dad tried to kill me. You know, mm-hmm. that's a lot for a child to, yes, to absolutely. deal with, you know. And so it definitely affects the children. Children are actually taken away from their mothers in the state of Michigan because of the failure to protect laws. So the Child Protection Services will take away children out of abusive homes because they feel like you're mm-hmm. failing to protect your children by allowing them to see you get abused. So women have come through our program, like, I need to get my own place because my kids are taken away. So that's, you know, like, I need to do something Mm -hmm. and I need to figure it out and I'm scared. And so it's just important that if you're in a situation that you connect with the program that can help you kind of work through everything that you're thinking, don't think like nobody cares about you or your situation isn't that bad and maybe he doesn't beat you so you don't feel like it's domestic violence but if it doesn't feel right it is and that's what we're here for to help you and work through that because domestic violence isn't always physical violence. correct 
uh, uh, sometimes it can be uh, mental and yes, verbal correct. abuse, you know. And mm-hmm. so, you know, a lot of women feel like, well, he's not. He's not he, beating me. He's not beating me. But, so, him, but sometimes things escalate and sometimes those <clears throat> internal fractures and internal scars from the emotional and the mental abuse cut deeper than the physical. That's true. That's true. Now, do you have men that have, you know, come to you maybe to actually, you know, maybe you can give them some, uh, some uh, referrals and, you know, that maybe they're in an abusive situation. So let's, unfortunately, know, unfortunately, there aren't too many. There aren't any programs that I'm aware of okay. that help that are focused for men. Now, all programs say we'll help men if they come to us. Okay. But men usually want to be in a group or work with other men right. and not, you know, that's the issue that I've had. Okay. Um, although I've had, we've been, this is our 10th anniversary this year, and I've had three men that have called for help, but they didn't want to come to our groups or anything like that. I just helped them, and they didn't even want to come down. I just yeah. kind of counseled them and helped them over the phone, right. and I hope it was helpful. I was willing to do that. So there are men who do go through this situation, but statistically even the numbers right. are a lot lower. And that's yeah. what we typically talk about, you know, women being abused more than men. Cause sometimes some women get upset when we do that and say, well, men get abused too. Yes, they do. But the numbers are really, the statistics are low of men that report it. If they're more, they're not reporting it or seeking out help. And I think that if there was a program developed by a man that could maybe reach or a program specifically for men that could reach out to victims, Mm -hmm. male victims of domestic violence, that that would be effective. And I would really be willing to work with and help support them. Okay. All right. Now, do you um, offer uh, housing um, assistance, you know, for women? No, uh, we don't. But we uh, we do give the numbers there. Housing and and resources in our community are low. There aren't a lot of um, programs available. There's a program that we do work with, Transition 123 in Detroit. Shakrice Miles is the executive director Mm -hmm. of that organization. And some others that work with us. So we just work with the people that that's their primary focus. We work with our niche around economic abuse, and then we connect and work with the other programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So in 2009, um, you were requested to speak at a congressional uh, briefing on economic abuse and its role in do- uh, domestic violence on behalf of the Women's Policy Incorporated in the YMCA. So tell us a little bit about that congressional. That was, yeah, that, that was actually really awesome. That was an awesome experience because that was the first time that I had opportunity to speak about this issue uh, globally. It was like... Um, televised on Univision and Telemundo and um, but 2009 was really at the height of when the whole conversation about economic abuse came to the forefront and um, so there was some studies done by Rutgers University to substantiate this work and that the fact that they invited me and they were really happy with how it turned out that we did a subsequent webinar with them together And so I'm always looking for opportunities to bring it forefront. I was really happy because there were a lot of legislators that actually show up for that and were interested in learning more about it, which I hope then helped to shape future policy to be more friendlier towards understanding these issues and that support and resources are needed on a national level to help um, programs to help survivors. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that that was a, I mean, really um, a great opportunity, you know, for you representing Detroit. Yes. <laughs> and uh, being in a place like that where the actual policies are being made, Correct. you know, on a congressional level. So that, you know, that was really, you know, impressive. Um, and we need, you know, we need to have that kind of, um, you know, dialogue. Definitely. Uh, with our uh, policymakers. Yes. That they can understand, you know, that this is a serious situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're thinking about doing or making laws, that you would think about some of the things that are being affected by women that are very real. Yes. Yeah. So that that was really good. And so um, your background is very diverse, and particularly for the African American women, and it also includes uh, domestic violence and as sexual violence. So would you say that they are closely? Related those two? No, but they usually fall under. They there's a lot of intersections. So there are people who are in intimate partner relationships. That their intimate partner, it could be your husband or your boyfriend, actually will rape you in the situations. You know, and so there's a lot of intersection between the two. But 
the work and the approach to work is often needs to be specialized. Mm -hmm. So there are some specialized programs like Sasha Center in Detroit right. that works specifically with sexual okay. assault of survivors. And there's other organizations that work with human trafficking. And so when we speak, or when we will all come together under the umbrella of violence against women, and, you know, because we might get someone who comes to our organization and says, I'm a survivor of domestic violence. And after you talk to them, you see they're raped and their daughter was raped by their abuser. So now I need to be able to quickly get you resources and connect you with other programs and counseling that can deal with that specific. Like you need to work through that while you're trying to worry about the, how you're going to get money and get safety and get this. And so it's all these different intersections that are going on simultaneously. And so as a movement, we have to work together. Right, right. So with the human trafficking, and I know a lot of young girls sometimes get caught up in that a lot of times. Um, they come through your organization sometimes, and you can help them now. They don't have to have children or you no. know, anything. And we don't, we don't typically get too many people <coughs> in regards to human trafficking seeking help through our organization as a gateway. We don't okay. usually, we usually don't. But we will get people who have been um, sexually assaulted that come through our organization. But... Because of this work that we do, we have, have to be abreast of what's going on. So just right. like yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, someone posted on my Facebook page looking for resources for a woman, for a girl, a young girl actually, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, who was human trafficked. And so I had to, like, okay, I looked online and quickly someone I know who's forefront in this matter tagged her in the same post so that she could come on and provide some information as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was reading a, <clears throat> excuse me, an article, um, too, as well, that now they are, um, and you can maybe speak on this, um, offering uh, where you can actually now get benefits if you are off from work uh, and you've been abused. And now you can now, you know, in your case, you weren't able to collect any kind of benefits, you know, right. like workman compensation, those kind of mm -hmm. things. Yeah, I read an article this morning. You know anything about that? I wrote that article oh. that you posted oh. this morning. <laughs> okay. Right. You posted it this morning. Yeah, yeah I read the article. I wrote right. the editorial for okay. the paper. So what we're asking is that employers consider, um, including in the sick time off, allowing survivors of domestic violence to use their sick time off for things like needing to go to court or um, doctor's appointments or things that revolve around the domestic abuse. So they don't lose their jobs because me as a human resource professional, this is what would happen. Me okay. as a survivor, when I started that job and they called me on the carpet, I was scared to take off for doctor's appointments and court dates because I was trying to get my 90 days in. Okay. And it was an open environment where I could say this. I didn't feel like the door was open where I could say this was going on. Now, maybe it was, but for a company to make a bold stand and say, we don't we want to support you as a whole person. If this is going on with you, these are some options and resources for you. We have an open door policy. We want to work with survivors of domestic violence. So so that is a a current conversation that we're having. Okay. All right. Well, I hope that that, you know, is something that will come about where you can really work with some of these employers and actually get that kind of benefit because it is real. You know, a lot it's of times real. women, they, they hide behind sunglasses. Yes. And they go to work. Yes. And, you know, only because of the fact that you, you know that you can't take off from that job. Right. You still got your children to feed. And I, I know that situation. Right. And, uh, you're, and a day or two to go to court will make a difference. And, right. and one thing is getting a conviction for this person so they're not a repeat offender right yes yes so um that that's really good and so well you keep on that thank you we're, we're hoping that that can work out and that can actually Definitely. be something yeah so um you're um as i said before your background is so so very diverse and again listening audience if you have any questions while we have the expert here uh, uh kaylin um uh, risker Boy, we do want you to call in. Feel free to call in. Again, that number is 248-796-8241. And, Kaylin, give them, again, give them your information as far as your website and telephone sure. number. So you can reach Safe Sisters Acquiring Financial Empowerment. You can find us on Facebook. Please like our page. There's a lot of updates there, and that's an easy way for you to also forward information to other people that you know. Check out our website, newsafestart.org. That's N-E-W-S-A-F-E-S-T-A-R-T 
dot org new say start dot org and you could call us at 800-757-4919 that's 800-757-4919 i have a couple other i know you're broadcast nationally a couple of national mm-hmm. resources that Please. people can tap into as well the national domestic violence hotline is the hotline dot org their number is 800-799-7233 that's 800-799-7233 there are also um, numbers for for teens, for teen dating violence, which is really becoming an epidemic. Okay. One is breakthecycle.org, and the other is love is not abuse. Dot org, And both of those not only have information for teenagers themselves, they have apps. They allow people to chat. You know, you can call, you can pull up a chat box and talk to someone if you feel like you're being abused. And um, there are also resources for teachers and for adults dealing with teenagers. So I would encourage anybody who has working or knows any teenagers to look at these websites and get this information because it's really, really a pervasive problem with our teen girls. Okay. And because of technology, we aren't as aware of it as quickly as we were in the past. And so we say teen dating violence like it's a cute thing, but it's intimate partner violence. And it's just as bad as anything that an adult is going through. Yeah. And with the Internet being, you know, so widespread the way it Mm -hmm. is, a lot of times these young girls, they're on, you know, the Internet and they're getting caught up in human trafficking. Because there's, you know, men that are on there, sexual predators that are on the Internet. And uh, a lot of times these girls are not even aware, you know, what kind of danger they're in. Correct. You know, runaways. Right. You know, because of the fact that they feel like somebody showed them, you know, some love that they're seeking that they didn't get maybe from their own fathers and they get caught up in that kind of, you know. And it definitely happens, but it even happens between boyfriends and girlfriends okay. where they're messaging inbox messages, where are you going, who are you with? I told you not to hang around that person. I told you not to wear that clothes anymore. You better come home. I, when I'm going to call you right after we get out of school, you better be there. And all of this is being done through text messages and Instagram messages, and you don't know um, that your child is going through this because it's all private. Okay. Well, we have a question. And the question is, is what law or legislation you feel are the most changing, uh, claim, damaging rather, to what you're doing and what can be done to help these, uh, these kind of things? Oh, very, very good question. Okay. Yes. Um, well, whenever the Violence Against Women Act is challenged and tr- there was a couple years ago where it was actually held up for some time and programs closed because they weren't able to sustain against that particular act also provides funding for national programs and state programs that then funneled it down to local programs. We don't get funding like that, but that particular funding provides a lot of resources that, that help a lot of the bigger programs, such as the shelter programs and things of that nature. So the violence against women act, provides a lot of resources it provides a lot of community awareness Mm -hmm. and so there definitely needs to be more work done to strengthen that that act as well and bring provide more resources on a on a national level states also need to increase as well and there is a global um decree or that many of the countries have signed off on to say that domestic violence is legal illegal on a global level so that's Mm -hmm. something that's growing Um, there was just some legislation in Barbados this week where they are trying to their their domestic violence they don't even have domestic violence laws on the books so when they prosecute they have to use some of the other laws to put it together so there are still countries out there that are struggling with that but here in the United States and locally there definitely needs to be more beefed up laws there needs to be more work done on the even on the local police level and this is where I'm working with the police chief and on the state level um, there is a anti-stalking law that's been put in place um, and so a lot of programs are really working on the laws and I'm supportive of them okay all right I know in some of the you know other countries third world countries particularly uh, where you have women that are in a very submissive, you know, mm-hmm. role, and a lot of times, and you know, without them really uh, realizing it, because that is just the way their culture is, 
that they are uh, being abused, you know, and, and from different cultures. Do you have women outside of the African-American community? Yes. That come so we, we worked with a couple of culturally specific programs in the Asian Pacific Islander community before and in the Latino community before. And so it's important to honor culture, okay. cultural and not trying to change people's culture. Right. But yet if any woman comes to us and requires services and feels right. like this isn't right, that we support them. And, you know, every culture, every really major culture, every major religion says domestic violence and beating your intimate partner or wife is not right. So it's a pretty much a universal standard of that. It's just how is it interpreted? And then yeah, how that, is that, that, how are those laws protected and enacted is right. where we're still fighting. Yeah. So, yeah. I can imagine that is um, a very hard thing to break through, as you said, if, you know, culturally, if that's the way it's been and you almost accept it because that's that's just how it's been. So a lot of those women, they are, they are, they're in that role where they just have, you know, embraced it. I don't think it's an embracing thing. I think it's a where do I go thing, you know, okay. and so this is where the laws and, and standards around, it's not really around culture, but around acceptance okay. and around that's their business is behind closed doors. Like, well, we disagree. We don't feel that you should beat on your wife, but right. it's not our business. So right. moving from the, it's not our business, which still exists in Detroit and everywhere else. The, it's not our business it's between two people, but seeing how this really does affect everyone. And that's the part I like to talk about is this it's happening behind closed doors, but they still interact with you. This still affects you. Right. And so moving it to that and how you can helping people helps everyone. Right. Wow, well, we almost are out of time. Well, tell us a little bit about what's coming up um, on the agenda and how I met uh, Kaylin or how I, I uh, come to know about your organization is yes. because of this health fair that you had, which was yes. so very nice. Safe uh, Health and so Wealth Expo. Yeah, so tell us, are you doing that this year? The plan is that we're going to do it this year. We're going to look at um, bringing it to a, also to a radio format. So bringing some of those workshop speakers and presenters and community information to a radio show near you is something we're looking at. We're definitely looking here. at. Yes, that's the plan. <laughs> the plan is to do it here. And then our Open for Business Conference, which is Opportunity Preparation, Entrepreneurship, and Networking for Survivors of Domestic Violence in April. So we really want people to sign up for that. And our ongoing program programming and support always okay give them your website one more time so sisters go. acquiring financial empowerment i'm kaylin risker the executive director and founder of safe can be reached at new safe start.org n-e-w-s-a-f-e-s-t-a-r-t.org and the number is 800-757-4919 800-757-4919 well kaylin Risker Foy. Yes. We thank you for coming today. Thank you for having and we me. We want to congratulate you on your new marriage, oh, recently thank you. being married. And uh, we are looking so forward to uh, hearing more from Kaylin. And, you know, she is one of those kind of people we know she's going to be doing some fantastic things wherever she is. And so we want to again thank you, listening audience. We pray that for those that have been helped today, that have heard what she has said, take it to heart. Uh, please, again, you know, you got her website, you got the number. Uh, call us. Let us know. We want you to know that we're here for you. And help is not only on the way. Help us here. So uh, thank you so much. This has been the Marketplace Connection. And we will see you again next week. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Marketplace Connection. You can find me on www.worshipcenterradio.net and all of our archive shows and video on demand shows are there. Thank you for listening and we will send you again next week.